so glad that you guys made it out tonight, man. You guys glad you came to church tonight? Hey, Amen. You ready for the word today? I hope you're ready for it. We're beginning this brand new series called Grateful. How many of you would say, like, I'm, I'm a pretty grateful person? I'm a grateful person. Anyone say, I'm a grateful person? It's one of those, I don't know, those qualities that are so attractive in a person. We don't think about it as much, but it is a powerful. Um, this series has the power to transform your life, you guys, to change your life with God, to change how you kind of react and relate to challenges and experiences you have, to change your relationships. If you're married today or not, like your relationships can be changed by this one attitude called gratitude. And I think that, that what I'm hoping in this series over four weeks is that we would grow up in gratitude. That, that many of us have, I think, um, uh, maybe a wrong perspective or maybe even an immature uh, perspective of what gratitude is. See, an immature perspective of being grateful is when good things happen to me, I can express gratitude. Uh, we think that it's that the happy people are the grateful ones, but it's actually the opposite. It's the grateful people that are happy. So here's this, this key series that we're going to hone in on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And let me kind of pause in this scripture for just a moment and teach this, you guys. Because the Apostle Paul is really giving us some, some foundational tools here with this. He says this, give thanks. And here's the kicker, in all circumstances. Give thanks. Don't just think grateful things, but express gratitude. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, thank you? Thank you. Come on, tell him, thank you. Okay, and now turn to the other neighbor that you didn't want to say thank you to and tell him thank you anyway, okay? <laughs> Because you know you looked at him, you're like, you don't deserve it. How about you? Thank you. Yeah, it's powerful. Just even saying it and receiving it, it is, it's, it's so, uh, it feels good to express gratitude and to receive gratitude. It's powerful. God says, I want you to do this, though, in all circumstances. It's easy to be grateful when things are going good. But how do we express gratitude when you're in the middle of a storm? When you're in a trial, in a difficulty. See, it's, it's in those circumstances, in, in the storm, in the, in, in, in the challenges of life that it's easy to lose hope, isn't it? You don't lose hope when things are going your way. You lose hope in the storm. It's in the middle of the, the difficulty and the tragedy and the challenges of life that, that we lose our passion. We give up on our dreams. We give up on our relationships. We don't know if God is even with us anymore. It's in the middle of the storm that God says, I want you to be grateful in those times. And, 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 the, and the reason why is because gratitude has this ability to, to elevate our altitude. Gratitude elevates our altitude. So no longer are we just giving way to the wind. We're not giving way to the storm and allowing it to the circumstances and the situations of our life to dictate our attitude and our responses through gratitude, it actually elevates me, my altitude above the storm. So now I have a different perspective. So now I can see from a different vantage point that I, did, I couldn't see when I was in the middle of the storm. When I can give thanks in this circumstance, I can actually get a different vantage point. I can begin to hope when even in the middle of it, it seems like there's no reason to hope. I can, I can be thankful and grateful because I see something bigger. I have a bigger picture than just the, the, the fog that, that we oftentimes live in. And I know sometimes even it, it can feel like it's disingenuine or phony to not express every feeling of the circumstances that you're experiencing. Like I'm in a storm. Why would I be grateful? Why would I act like I'm not in a storm. And that is, that is, why, that is why I'm talking about here. I need you to grow up in gratitude. See, kids, kids respond that way. When they don't get their way, the kid throws a pity party. The kid is only grateful when you get the kid what the kid wants, okay? He's not grateful for what he does not understand yet. And if we want to grow up, you got to learn how to express, be grateful in all circumstances. Because, and here's why, this is, it's so important to God. He says this, that this is actually God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, God's will for you is not for you to exist in the storm. It's not for you to be buffeted by your circumstances and tossed around by them. His will for you is to raise your altitude above the storm. 
That's his will. That is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That there's actually a lot of, lot of scientific benefits of gratitude, of being grateful. That, that the studies, science is always catching up to the word of God, of what God has called us to do and has tells us to do and encouraged us to do. It's always catching up. But now they're saying, dude, this thing called gratitude, you don't need to be a slave to your feelings. You don't need to be, be a slave to the storm. Just because you're experiencing it doesn't mean you need to express it. Come on, somebody. That was a word right there. Just because you're experiencing it doesn't mean you can express something different. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to do that today, like in all circumstances. But science is saying now, if you grateful people, people that are more grateful than they are critical or complaining or grumbling, people that have more gratitude in their life, they're, they're not just happier people. They have better relationships. They have better mental, psychological health, emotional health. That, that it even, they said that, that a study showed that they even sleep better if they are more grateful in their life. It is God's will for you. And not just because like these scientific like proven benefits, but check this out. When you're ungrateful, it divides and separates. Un ungrateful causes distance. Gratefulness causes fellowship. And this is why it's God's will for you. I really believe why. All those other benefits, they're great. But the reason why this attitude of gratitude is God's will for you in Christ Jesus is because there is power in this attitude. That when you, when you are ungrateful, it separates, and this is true of any heavenly relationship and earthly relationship. Any, when you are ungrateful of the people in your life, it'll cause distance between those people. You could be living with somebody, married to somebody, but feel so distant from them. And, and part of the reason could be because all you guys do is complain and criticize and, and grumble and nitpick each other. You keep doing that and there's going to be distance in that relationship. It's the same thing with God. When our relationship with God, if all we do is grumble and complain, and if we're ungrateful, it causes distance. It's not that God's not there. His word says he is an ever-present help in time of need. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So he's there, but our feelings are something different. It feels like God is so far away. Why? Because we're ungrateful. But on the flip side of that, when we are grateful, this causes fellowship. It causes unity. It causes things to come closer and to become stronger in relationship. And you test this out in any of your earthly human relationships. Is there any relationship that you might uh, find there to be friction in or, or there's distance in? Uh, test this. Start expressing, like verbally expressing your gratitude in that relationship and watch God move. It, it, it will cause their, the distance to close the more grateful you express, the more gratitude in that relationship. And the same thing is with God. The more grateful I am to God, the closer, the more real this relationship is. Give thanks in all circumstances. So in this series, we got four weeks, you guys. In this series, we're going to look at some of the circumstances in life that it's just hard. It's hard to, to give thanks. But if we want to grow up, mature up in our gratitude, if we want to be elevated above the storm, we got to learn how to be grateful, how to give thanks in all circumstances. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, another great verse. Ephesians chapter 5 says, make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for what? For everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So today, we are going to talk about the circumstance that might be one of the most difficult uh, to express gratitude in, and that is uh, being grateful in the delays of life. How do I express gratitude when I feel like I've been waiting for so long? God, I, I, the dream has not come to pass. The promise that you gave me the vision you gave me. I read the word, it says this, but I don't see this in my life. And there's a, there's a distance, there's a gap, there's a delay between, between what I think and what I believe you want to do and what you said you were going to do to what is my reality. It's hard for us to, and it's easy in the delay to drift from your purpose, to drift from your dream, to get lost in the middle of it. So how? How do we do that? Here's, here's the, a key truth in this series that I I want you to grab hold of, write this down. Just because it's delayed doesn't mean it's denied. Delays are not denials, 
Okay, God's, God's not yet are not not ever. See, God, God sees differently than we see. He works on a different timeline than we, and listen, his timing is perfect. It's perfect. So, so, but it's real. The struggle is real. I get it. David had the same struggle of, 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 of receiving the promises of God and understanding and knowing the promises of God, but, but waiting for them is extremely hard. And he expresses this in Psalm 69, verse 3. David says this, I am weary with my crying. I don't know if you've ever been there, that you've been waiting so long, like you can't even cry anymore. Like you've cried about this marriage, about this relationship, about this, about this challenge, about this addiction, about this, about this, this mindset, about this person. You've just cried and you can't even, he says, I'm weary of crying. My throat is parched. My eyes are failing. They're not even working. My tear ducts are not even working anymore while I wait for you, my God. I don't know if you can sympathize with David in this, that you feel like you've been waiting and there's a delay from what you read in the Bible, what you hear someone preach about or teach about, what even you believe, there's a delay. I want to give you today um, five reasons why God delays. And we have to understand these because it's actually part of the process. There's, re there's reasons why. See, the delays aren't denials. There may be a reason for the delay. And I want to start off with this first one that is so key. This first reason why God delays. If you can't get this, if we can't understand this come to come to peace with this first principle of why god delays then you will never live a grateful life then you will never be content in life i gotta start here this is number one number one his ways are not your ways hey his ways they're not your let me say it this way you are not god okay you are not God, and he is not obligated to fulfill all of your desires on your timeline. His, his ways are not our ways. It comes right out of Isaiah 55 where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, God says, my ways. Can I pause right there, take a time out, and just say, I'm so grateful God don't think like me. Is anyone with who, I am so glad God does not think the way that I think or act the way that I, I wouldn't want to serve that God. I'm just, I would not want to serve a God who's thinking like me or acting like me, okay? I'm, I'm glad that God is on a, you know, higher level of thinking. He actually says, as the heavens are higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Now, now this principle that his ways are not our ways can either be frustrating or freeing for you depending on how you view God. See, if today, if, if you're hearing this reality that his ways are not your ways and he may delay some things because he's, he's thinking differently and acting, this, if you're thinking right now, oh, but why can't he do what, why, why, why? It's, it's probably be your view, you may view God as, as a dictator, as a judge, as Santa Claus, I don't know, but you got the wrong view of God. If, if your view of God is that you serve a good father who is always working out good in your life, then this reality, this truth that his ways are not our ways is liberating. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to wrestle with it anymore. I can just trust in my God, his way. I thank God that his ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. But that's the first reality that we need to understand. When, when there is a delay, his ways are not our ways. Here's another reason why God will pause in our life. He'll put the pause button, right? Here's another reason. He's trying to teach us to trust him completely. He's trying to teach us to trust him completely. Now, you can either have the control or trust in God, but you can't have both. Those things cannot coexist. You need to choose. Do you want to grab control of it? Or do you want to trust God with it? Proverbs chapter 3 says it like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own 
understanding. But that's where it gets difficult, right? That's, it's hard to trust God when in our own understanding, we can't figure it out. Like it doesn't make sense. It looks like it's going in the wrong direction. You see, the reason why God delays is because he's trying to build within us a dependency upon him, a trust upon him along the way. Someone say along the way. You see, gratitude in the delay is faith along the way. Come on, I'm rapping now, somebody, dropping it like, uh, uh. I've been listening to too much Kanye. Here's, throughout Scripture, the new Kanye, not the old Kanye, by the way, okay? Throughout Scripture, God, we see God inviting people into, into a journey, a journey that, that they don't know all the details all throughout Scripture. And I know, I know, like I wish God would tell us all the details when he says, come on, come follow me. I wish he would go, look, and here's what's going to happen. You're going to go here, then go here, and then go over there. But watch out. Over here, it's not going to be that good, but check it out. This is what I'm doing. And then you're going to go over here. and go. That's not what God does. He's trying to teach us to trust him completely throughout the Scriptures. He does that. And we need to get to a place where we don't need to always know the plan because we trust the planner. And so God may pause, God may delay to actually teach us that, to trust him completely. Here's another reason why God will press the pause button. Number three, to prepare our character for the weight of the calling. God, God wants to prepare your character for the weight of the calling. See, it's actually a blessing. Thank God he didn't give us everything that we wanted or that we asked for in the season that we asked for it. So, see, the, God, God, if he were to give us everything we asked for in the timeline we asked for it, those blessings that we asked for would actually crush and ruin our life. See, he wants to bless you and he wants to provide for you and he actually has good things, the Bible says, ahead of you and in store for you. But in order for you to steward the blessing, hold and carry those blessings appropriately, he's got to develop your inner life, your character for the calling that he has for you. We see this in, in the Israelites as they're wandering in the desert. The Bible says they wandered for 40 years because of their, their grumbling and complaining, which is actually the opposite, the exact opposite of gratitude. They were grumbling and complaining about God after he parted the seas, delivered them from slavery, after he performed miracles and signs and wonders, fed them by miraculous manna. Okay, protected them by night with a fire, a pillar of fire. All of this, they grumbled and complained. And the Bible says because of their grumbling and complaining, they marched around that wilderness for 40 years. They actually, they were marching around Mount Sinai. That's what they were doing. They were just going around and around that mountain for 40 years. Hey, check it out. You, some of you have been going around the same mountain, the same trial, the same trouble, the same trauma, and you're reacting the same way way and as you continue to react that way with grumbling and complaining you're going to continue to march around that mountain god wants to develop your see he there's a promised land it was actually just miles away but god said no you can't you you, you won't steward that promise if i gave you the blessing now you wouldn't treat it with the sacred with the with the way you're you should treat it i need you to develop your character for the weight of the promise so in the middle of the delay, there's a delay sometimes because we might be looking all out here. We're like, God, do this, fix that, do that. God doesn't care about that as much as you care about that. All that's going to burn and fade away. God cares about what's happening in here. So he pauses, he waits to develop your character for the weight of the calling. Here's another reason why God delays, and that is to build our faith, to build our faith. See, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. But, but how much of our life do we just accomplish in our own strength, in our own effort, by our own creativity, by our own problem-solving skills? If we were honest, we would say, I think of a lot of our days or of a lot of the things we accomplish, that didn't take any faith at all to do that. Some of us live entire days, weeks maybe, of of. An honest statement would be, I didn't need faith in God to do that. I, I did that. And this is, this is why it's so important that God delays, because he knows you could do it, but he doesn't want you to be successful. He wants you to live eternal. Oh, man, I, look, again, you're out here 
going, oh, I want to, God, take care of this. I want to fix it. I want to accomplish this. And I got goals. And God's like, that's not as important as you think it is. I want you to, so he'll pause. He'll cause a delay when you could, because he's trying to teach us. He's trying to build faith. And it's so important. Paul goes as far to say in Romans chapter 14, he says, everything that does not come from faith is what? See, when you do it in your own effort, in your own strength, when it doesn't take any faith for you to live your day, to accomplish your tasks, the, Paul says, man, that's a sin. So God will intentionally cause a delay in your life to teach you to walk by faith and not by sight, to live by faith and not by your own strength. So, so, so he'll pause. There's a delay to build our faith. And here's the fifth reason I'll give you. God will delay some things in our life so he can be glorified. Now, God isn't, isn't an attention seeker. And he's like, oh, I need to get the glory. No, no. Look, this is, the difference is you're not getting the glory. Okay? See, so, so you're not getting the glory. It's not for you to get the glory, for you to get promoted. God delays some things so that he can be glorified in and through your life. Okay? In John chapter 11, there's a perfect example of this delay so that he would receive glory. Um, we see the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus, all, which this family, they're all you know, brothers and sisters, were a, the friends of, of Jesus. Like he spent time with them, intimate time. They were his friends. Lazarus got sick, and it was a sickness that was looking like he was going to die from it. So Mary and Martha pen a letter to Jesus, who wasn't in the town. He was in a different town. So they write him a letter and say, hey, this ain't looking good, Jesus. We need the healer. We need you to do what you do, what you've been doing, Jesus. Come on through. Come on through for your friend. And Jesus tells them, the sickness, this sickness, will not end in death. <laughs> the crazy thing is, Lazarus dies. <laughs> right? So, which, which Mary and, and Martha would have known about the resurrection. They believed in it. And actually, if you go read, you go read John chapter 11, you can read this in your own devotion time. I'd love for you to read it because Martha actually tells Jesus, I know he's going to get raised from the dead. I know he'll be raised in the resurrection, but I thought you were going to do something before that, Jesus. I'm disappointed in, in, in that. See, some of, some of you need to let go of what you expected it to be. See, you're not even held captive by the storm, by the trial you're experiencing. What's holding you captive is what you thought it would be. He didn't, Jesus didn't work in your timeline or how you expected him to work. And that's what's holding you back. It's not even the trial anymore. You're mad at God. Oh, come on. The sickness, he says, won't end in death. No, it's actually for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And now it says Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he rushed off to his friend. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't it actually says something that's weird, right? He stayed where he was two more days. And that was a very long two days for Mary and Martha. In that two-day time period, Lazarus died. He waits. He intentionally paused, delayed what they wanted and the timeline that they wanted. it. So after two days, he tells the disciples, hey, let's go. Let, let's go to our friend. And they go and... Mary and Martha here, Jesus is coming. He's coming late though. Martha runs out to meet Jesus. Mary, the Bible says, stays at home. She was, she was so caught up in her disillusionment and what she expected Jesus to do. And if the Bible doesn't say like what her attitude was, but you can like imagine she's sulking, probably frustrated, probably angry at Jesus, trying to punish him, I bet. Oh, I'm not going out to see Jesus. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not even going to church because of what he did. So Mary goes out and meets, or Martha does, and meets Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus, when he gets closer, though, thank God, thank God Mary didn't stay in her seclusion. It actually says that Mary, when, when he gets closer, close enough to the stink of Lazarus, he's now decaying in, in the tomb, that Mary runs out of her house and kneels at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says another hard thing to Mary. I'm glad for you I wasn't there. I'm glad I wasn't there when you wanted me to be there because I had something better in mind. So that you may believe. 
And, and, and right there, Mary gets a glimpse of her savior, of Jesus, that she had never seen before. Jesus wet, weeps for his friend. And he speaks in a loud declarative voice for this body to be raised back to life. And Lazarus gets up, walks out of that tomb, looking like a mummy and all. You see, Mary, if she, she would have missed the miracle if she stayed in her seclusion of what she expected God to do and God to perform for her in the timeline. Look, she needed to know that God's delays are not God's denials. Sometimes the, the setbacks are just setups for a get up in our life. Amen, Amen somebody? God wanted to be glorified even greater than she was even could imagine. She could not, his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not all our ways. And then Jesus reminded Mary of this truth. He said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did, so, so listen, if you can believe something different, about your storm, if you can believe today something different about your circumstance, about your relationship, about the crisis, about, about whatever that is that is ailing you, worrying you, stressing you, if you can just believe something different, see, that's where gratitude can come from. If you believe something different in the middle of it, God says, I will show you my glory in the middle of the storm. So we're gonna change our lives by changing the way that we think. All right, in the, in the next 21 days over this four-week series, and honestly, for the whole month of November, as we lead into Thanksgiving, it doesn't need to happen one day a week, one day a year, I mean. We can, we can live grateful lives. I'm issuing for this church a gratitude challenge, all right? A gratitude challenge that, that man, as we start to expect great things, we're going to experience great things inside of our life. Here's the gratitude challenge. Inside of your notes, there's a few fill-ins. I wrote it, I put it in there for you so that you can go on this journey with me these next 21 days. It says this, I will thank God in the what? In the little things. See, that's where I want you to start. I want you to start right there in the little things. Just, what are the little things? Just think it, because some of you are like, what am I gonna thank God for? It sounds silly. No, trust me, start there. Thank God for your life. Thank God that you're breathing. Thank God that you have a right mind. Thank God that you have that job. Stop complaining about that job, okay? Just thank God that he's given you provision to meet your needs and the needs of your family. Just start thanking God for the little things. Thank you, God. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten fingers. Thank you, God, for all ten of these fingers. I don't care what you got to do, but start in the little things. Listen, if you can start expressing gratitude, it's going to build up momentum. It's going to build up faith, and you'll be able to start experiencing and expressing gratitude in the greater things. So I will thank God in the little things, as well as acknowledge Him in the blessings of my life. What's that word? Daily. 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 So we're going to start off our day. Here's the challenge, man. We're going to start off our day, and we're going to find the reasons to be grateful. Look, if you don't set the tone of your day, the devil will set it for you. All right, we're going we're to express our gratitude for the, for the little things. We're going to acknowledge God and the blessings, but we're not going to stop there. Every day, we're going to find the opportunity in every opposition. Look, it's easy. It's easy. It doesn't take maturity to, to see opposition and, and see what's wrong, to find the opposition. No, it doesn't take maturity. It takes great faith and maturity to find the opportunity, what God may be doing in the opposition and express my authentic gratitude within the delays and the difficulties I face. Each day, we're gonna set our mind in this direction. And God, I'm telling you, if you do this, your relationship with God will change. Your relationship, the relationships you have on this planet will change. Uh, your, the, the way that you handle the challenges, the storms and the difficulties, you will elevate your altitude through gratitude. This has the power, I promise you to change your life. Colossians chapter three says, and be thankful, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How many of you like singing? You don't like singing here? You don't like singing? I love worshiping. I am not a good singer, but I love worshiping God. Listen, this is the, the reason why we, every week, we, we like gather together 
and we sing psalms and spiritual songs and it's it's actually you look at these words look at the 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 words and listen to the verses that you're saying and singing it is a declaration of faith it's not what you may be experiencing now but just because you're experiencing doesn't the difficulties doesn't mean you need to express the difficulties see and so, listen some of you you sit here i know i ain't looking at you because i'm worshiping but i already know some of you ain't singing It'd be a lot louder in here if every one of you were singing. Look, and this is, this is, the, and I know, like, I know you don't sound good. That's okay. Neither do I, okay? But there's, when you, when you don't, when you express your gratitude, it has transforming power. I, I just challenge you not only to be thankful and to do it daily, but to express, it needs to be expressed through praise, expressed through thanksgiving to God. He says, do it, express gratitude, but sing those songs. Sing those hymns, sing those spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. So we're going to change our lives, our relationships, our future, our destiny through gratitude. But there are some things that we need to know or learn about gratitude because, because in, immediate gratification can never give you this kind of gratitude. See, I'm talking about spiritual gratitude, not just, not just a mental fix or an attitude. I'm talking about the spiritual value of being grateful. In fact, um, gratification isn't even where this kind of gratitude starts. It's not the orig it doesn't originate in being gratified, okay? Here's, here's the first thing I want you to know about gratitude, this kind of gratitude. This kind of gratitude actually flows from the presence of God. The more you know God and love God, the more grateful you will be. This kind of gratitude flows from the presence of God. This is why you can't manufacture gratitude. You can't willpower gratitude. See, what I want to do, what I hope to do is to lead you to the presence of God where through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can give you a new perspective in the middle of your storm. See, because gratitude, the, the definition of gratitude is the perception of the good. I hope you can catch this. It's not, it's not that good things are happening to you. It's the perception of the good in spite of the bad things that are happening to you. I, can, I, can, I got a different vantage point. I can, I can see God in the middle of my storm. Here's the key. Can you keep your eyes fixed on the presence of God even in the presence of your enemies? Okay, because the psalmist says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, even though I'm surrounded by enemies, even though I have to wait, even though there's a storm or a delay. So you need an even though kind of faith, you guys, that even though this is happening, even though gratitude can thank him for his presence in the presence of your enemies. Gratitude flows from the presence of God. And we just read, we read earlier in the beginning of the message how David, you know, was weary for the delays of life. But he, he was also, not only was David kind of, was very authentic in expressing that, but he was also very quick to remember who his God was and express his gratitude. Psalm 103 shows us David saying, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I know it's not going well right now, but he's speaking to his soul. Soul? Don't be, don't be swayed by the storm, soul. Soul, you better praise the Lord, oh my soul. And what's the, forget not all his benefits. See, whenever, whenever you're ungrateful in life, if you're experiencing that, it's a sure sign you've forgotten who you serve. You've forgotten how good God is. You've forgotten what God is doing. You forgot the good things that God has. And it's easy to get sidetracked to focus on all the wrong things. He says, hey, I'm not going to, in the middle of this, I'm not going to forget all of my God's benefits. He's forgiven me of all my sins. How many are forgiven here today? He heals of all diseases. How many experience the healing power of God? He redeems your life through the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things. See, the good things are produced by being grateful. You don't, it, it's not good things come, then I express gratitude. No, gratitude precedes the good things. In fact, not in your notes, but more gratitude won't actually come from more acquisition of things, but from more awareness of God's presence 
and God's goodness in your life. See, if you want to be marked by this, if you want to grow up in gratitude, uh, what we need to do is become more aware of the presence of God and the goodness of God in our life. Do you recognize, you guys, that every good and perfect gift has come down from God to you? That God has given us every good thing in our life. Gratitude flows from the presence of God. Here's the second thing about gratitude we need to know. Gratitude grows in humility. Whenever there's, there's, there's gratitude, it al it's always involves a posture of humility. If I think I'm owed something, I'm not going to be thankful for it when I get it. Okay? If, and there is a great sense of entitlement in our culture, in our society today. Everyone thinks they're owed something, that they're entitled to something. Now, if you think you're owed something, you're not going to be grateful when you get it. If, if someone were just to give you the keys to a car or to a truck or whatever you want, you... If they just give it to you, you say, oh my, thank you so much. You bless me. I, I didn't deserve this. I didn't even ask for it. Wow. You would be ecstatic. You'd be grateful. But if you paid fair market value for that car and, you, and they gave you the keys, you'd be like, all right. All right. Thank you. It's, 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 diff it's totally different depending on what you think you are owed or entitled to. See, here's, see, you need to recognize that everything good you have comes from God because the more you think you're entitled to, the less you will be grateful for. Why is it that people get more and more and they're experiencing more and more in their life? They show less and less gratitude. It's because the bigger our sense of entitlement, the lesser our sense of gratitude. And our, my sinful mind can convince me that I'm entitled to a lot. You know, that, and when I don't get what I think I'm owed, someone must have messed up. It's somebody's fault. Somebody ought to pay for this because I was owed. So I was owed this. And this is where there has been a proliferation of lawsuits because people think they are entitled and they are owed something. I was doing some research. Let's check these, some of these lawsuits from entitled people. The San Francisco Giants, they were sued a few years back for passing out Father's Day gifts to men only. A psychology professor was sued for sexual harassment because of the presence of mistletoe at Christmas, a Christmas party. That mistletoe offends me. How about this one? This one's crazy. A psychic was awarded $986,000 when a doctor's CAT scan impaired her psychic abilities. You got to wonder about that last one, right? Because if she was psychic, wouldn't she have known that that CAT scan was going to... I'm just, I'm just saying. This is, see, this is God's will for you, to give thanks in all circumstances, not just when it's going good, but to grow up in gratitude, to elevate your altitude in the middle of those circumstances, to express gratitude it is God's will for you. When you become ungrateful, it causes distance and separation. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, Paul explains in the beginning of, of Romans chapter 1 how humanity fell away from God. And, and you'll be surprised why, why there, this even happened. Why is there such a distance between God and humanity? What happened here? Because although they knew God, at one point they knew God. But here's what happened. They stopped glorifying him as God nor gave thanks to him. This is how it originated. Why the fall, of, why the distance between God and man? They stopped giving him glory and they stopped giving him thanks. And it says, and because of that, their thinking got jacked up. Their, their thinking, they actually, it says that they claimed to be wise, but they were actually fools. I can, I can imagine it like, oh, look what I built. Look at the life I built. Look at the house I live. Look at, the, look at my education. Look at my status. Look what I built. Look, look at my security. They claimed to be wise, he said. They stopped giving God glory. They stopped thanking him. But they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. See, didn't Jesus say, if, if you believe, I'll show you my glory. God, and so what they did is they, they stopped glorifying, giving thanks to God, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the glory of this world. 
Why? Why? How? Because they stopped giving him thanks. So it says that God actually, therefore, it says, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their heart. Gratitude grows in humility. It's when we recognize we can be grateful for every good thing, for every day, for every breath, for every gift, for every relationship. God, thank you for these gifts. You are the originator of everything good. I am not owed or entitled to anything. Here's the third thing I want you to know about gratitude. As we do this gratitude challenge, gratitude leads to a life of blessing. See, you don't wait for the blessing and then be grateful. No, gratitude precedes the blessing. Gratitude opens the door to blessing. Gratitude opens the door to joy, opens the door to your dreams being fulfilled. It's easy to get focused on the problems of your life rather than the blessings of your life. But the the question is, do you want more problems or more blessings? Because wherever you choose to focus, you're going to get more of. Where, where, the, 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 wherever you focus, it's, it's actually going to produce more in your life. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says this. Let us not become weary in doing good. For in the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, don't give up along the way. Yes, there's a delay. Don't give up along the way. Continue to plant seeds of faith. Plant seeds of hope. And you water those seeds with gratitude. And in the proper time, in God's time, you will reap a harvest. A harvest is coming. You have to learn how to thank God in advance for the blessing. You see, thanking God in advance is a declaration of faith. In gratitude, what you're saying is, God, I'm so sure of your goodness. I'm so sure you're a good God that even though I'm not experiencing good right now, I'm going to thank you for the good that's coming tomorrow from this. That's thanking God in advance. Remember, it's faith is what pleases God. Faith is what moves him. Faith is what opens the door to the promises entering your life. From the time we pray to the time of fulfillment is called, in the Bible, it's called the trial of our faith. And this is where so many people get discouraged in the delay. So many people give up. They start believing the negative thoughts. It's never going to happen. I'm never going to make it. The seed is still alive. It's just dormant. And you need to start watering the seed. You can't wait to receive the promise. You have to thank God along the way. Stop talking about what you're feeling and experiencing now and start thanking God by faith. God, I thank you that my dreams are going to come to pass. God, I thank you that you're turning this relationship around. God, I thank you in advance that this trial will not take me out. You're removing this obstacle in Jesus' name. When you thank God in in advance for the answer, you're not only watering the seed of the promise, but you're strengthening your own faith. You're not going to, listen, you're not going to strengthen your faith by grumbling and complaining. You're only going to strengthen your faith by expressing gratitude that is coming out in praise and thanksgiving to God. All right, here's the last thing I'm going to give you. I'm going long. Forgive me. Gratitude arises in imperfection. Gratitude, this kind of gratitude we're talking about, not just when things are going good, it actually arises in imperfection. And so here's what I want you to do. Every time you're tempted to worry, every time you're stressed out, every time that you feel like you're going through a challenge or a crisis or a storm, right there in the middle of that, I want you to pause right there and and let it be a sign to you from this day forward that this is a sign when I'm worrying, stressed, And and I'm in the middle of a battle. It's a sign for you to plant new seeds in the soil. Because if I want a different outcome, I need a different input. In the middle. So when you start experiencing it, I'm going to start thanking God for some things in advance. I'm going to start planting some seeds in the soil. I need a different outcome from this. I I need something different. So I'm going to plant some seeds of gratitude. And here's why. Here's why you can be grateful in the middle of, of the imperfections of life. The promise of Romans chapter 8, 28. A lot of you know this promise. I'm just reminding you of it today. I'm just, because it's easy, because it's, it's one thing to know it. It's, it's another thing to live it in the storm. And I'm just remind. I'm just trying to fan something inside of you today, help you to grow up in gratitude, church. Here's why you can do it, because we know 
Come on, do you know, church? Do you know some things? We know that in all things, yes, in the delays, yes, in the storms, yes, in the crisis, we know that in all things, God works for the good. And not just of everybody, right? For those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So God is saying, come on, I'll work. You got, God, this is a promise of God that if you love him, if you can stay focused in the middle of your enemies, in the middle of the storm, if you can just say, focus, God says, hey, just, just, just love me, prioritize me. And if you can just live not for your purpose, not for your will, not for your end game, but if you can will, if you can live according to my will, according to my purpose, God says, I'll work out, I'll work it out for good in your life and show you my glory. And what is what is God's will? What is God's will? Let's tie it all the way back to the beginning of the message. The first, it is God's will for you to give thanks in all circumstances. See what Romans 8 and 28 is actually saying. God is saying, if you can be grateful in the middle of it, if, if, if you can exercise faith, if you can, if you can, if you can be grateful in the middle of it, I'll bring good out of it. And I'll show you my glory through it. Come on, bow your heads right there. I want to pray for you, church.